We have assembled. No. Okay. We have assembled a remarkable panel of leaders who are game changers in the water industry. We have a member of the California State Assembly, Laura Friedman, who has authored legislation that will prepare California for future droughts and enact long-term water conservation policies. We have Marcy Edwards, the former general manager of the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, and was the first woman to read the nation's largest municipal uh, utility and run it beautifully. Jennifer West, Executive Director of the Water Reuse Association California Session, who is leading the way to get uh, direct potable reuse regulations drafted and adopted in California. Rather than presentations followed by a question and answer, the format of this session is more like a round table discussion. And uh, time permitting, you'll get a chance to ask some questions. So uh, to lead the round table, Marcy Edwards. Marcy? Am I supposed to go up? Yep. You wanna... okay. Oh, I think my mic should Oh, be you got one. Okay. okay. Fantastic. Ladies, have fun. We have Thank that. you very much, my absolutely favorite weather caster. And I'd like you to know I'm very happy to sit in the princess chair. <laughs> there you go. Oh, I'm so glad Hi. I came. Hi. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here today to help facilitate this session and see so many familiar faces in the room. Um, the depth of expertise in water that's captured by this group is truly awesome and it's a place where the term water buffalo is still a compliment. <laughs> We're very aware we stand between you and your ultimate departure. So with that, I know this looks like it's 27 pages but it's like in 400 font and I still, I still can't see it. Assembly Member Friedman, thank you again for being here. Thanks for having me. Ooh. You proposed an interesting approach to drought response and long-term planning. Could you summarize your effort? Sure. I have uh, two bills that deal with water planning. One is AB 1667, the other is AB 1668. Uh, 1667 deals with agricultural water plants, and I assume that that's probably not as of interest to this group, so I'll talk about 1668. Both bills are an attempt to have a framework for the governor's goal of making water conservation a way of life. Um, both bills are right now um, kind of in a unique uh, position of having been pulled back by the legislature and by the government, not put forward as trailer bills as we thought they might be, or they, they passed off the floor of the assembly, but rather than send them over to the Senate, we kind of got this special permission to have a process to work them through policy so that we can have a robust discussion with different stakeholders. So we have a small group, a bipartisan group of members from the assembly um, from all over California that are working um, to discuss both bills actually, but primarily 1668, um, to really work through some of the issues that have been brought up. So the plan of, the, the, the idea behind the bill is to, um, uh, make sure that the state updates requirements for urban water management and for water supplies, uh, water shortages, um, uh, to make sure that we have a resilient supply and also to forward the goal of making sure that every agency moves towards being as efficient and cost effective as we can possibly be. So as we know, we just came out of this really historic drought. And we felt that the drought demonstrated that not everyone in the state is really prepared for going into a future of periods of intense shortage and periods of intense rain. What 1668 does is it requires that every five years drought planning is done and approved by the state water board um, to look at different levels of drought, five different levels of drought. So that's the basic idea behind it. The standards haven't been um, you know, decided yet. That'll happen through a robust stakeholder um, participation. Uh, but the hope is to move away from drought planning that requires sort of arbitrary percentage reductions when we're in drought, which of course penalize agencies that are already efficient um, and don't have any baseline. If you say everybody has to 
all of a sudden cut back 20% or 30%. You're not working from any baseline, so it's, it's, it's not really a, an effective way of implementing drought planning. So we'd rather that we have plans that are tailored to each different agency that then get approved every five years so that we can you know, kind of know what everyone's going to do under the different levels of drought. I'm Hopefully that makes sense. Sorry. A curiosity question. Could you share what got you initially interested in making long-term water planning a legislative priority? Well, I'll take a step back even before that. I was on the Glendale City Council for seven years before I was elected to the legislature. And I remember uh, when I was first on the assembly, we had some issues in our water department in terms of them wanting to build storage and kind of what the storage would be and how much they would spend on it. And I remember we had this great water people. They were you know, absolutely wonderful. They came in front of the council and they, in, you know, in your, in your best engineering terms, explained the need to have the storage, talking about acre feet and pressure and you know, uh, what the price was and met water and not met water and the entire council kind of sat there and looked at them like with cross-eyed and had no idea what they were talking about. <laughs> and we were, you know, kind of being asked to raise water rates and, you know, without much of an understanding of how, what those rates meant and what the charges went to. And then, of course, having to explain to the public who elected us why we were raising their water rates. And it occurred to me that it would behoove me as an elected official to understand more about water because it's such an important commodity and it was becoming a lot more on people's minds because we were in drought and the rates were going up and people are saying, well, why are the rates going up? Because water runs down the street and I can just scoop it up and you know, where does it come from and it rains and why should I have to pay you and you know, all the things that you hear. So I found out that we got water for, and, and then our, metro, our Met director who represented the city made this huge mistake of taking me on a Met tour. <laughs> and for that, he was rewarded by being removed from the Met board. He was a city employee, so don't feel so bad. And I put myself on the Met board instead to learn about all those things and primarily to, feel, to be a bridge between my constituents and what was happening with water, with rates, with infrastructure. I felt that the more I could learn and the more I was responsible by being on that board, the more of a compelling story I could give them when I did vote to raise their rates or to change the water structure or to have tiered rates and ultimately to do conservation, that I would really understand it. So I went on the MEP board and I was on there for about seven years and um, then I got elected to the legislature and I carried that interest forward. So now I'm, I'm hoping to you know, be involved in, in trying to craft water policy and I'll tell you, as you know, it's challenging and it's super exciting and I'm really enjoying just getting into the weeds and policy in a way that I, you know, have never done and don't really even have the expertise for, but someone up there has to do it. And uh, having been on the MEP board, I feel like I know, you know, probably a little more than the average bear in terms of legislators. That's probably very true. <laughs> <laughs> don't read into what I say. Why are you all I laughing? Say. I don't understand. <laughs> all right. First of its kind guidance document titled Framework for Direct Potable Reuse was released in late 2015. Help state regulatory agencies, utilities develop guidelines for safely converting wastewater into municipal drinking water through the emerging practice of direct potable reuse, or DPR. Jennifer, could you please explain to our audience what DPR is, and, and also as importantly, what it is not, and perhaps speak to efforts in California to establish regulations, and where are we in the process overall? All right, well, thank you for having me, I appreciate it. Um, we're at a really exciting point right now, maybe the crossroads that David Sedlak showed earlier um, in terms of where we are in terms of potable reuse in California. First of all, the first part, what is direct potable reuse? Um, potable reuse is the highly treated recycled water that has gone through a multi-setup treatment process that comes out at the end, it meets and exceeds all drinking water standards. Then subcategories of potable reuse depend on what we call it is where we actually use it. So for groundwater, we call it indirect potable reuse because it has that environmental buffer. So that and surface water augmentation, which they're about ready to put regulations out for as well, using that highly purified water to put into reservoirs. So we've actually made some significant progress where we are um, in 2015, I believe, is when the, or excuse me, 2014, the state adopted finally, after almost 30 years, believe it or not, uh, groundwater regulations for indirect potable reuse. Um, so that was a huge step forward there. 
We're, as I said, they're six months late, but the water board is about to come out with the regulations to use this purified water in reservoirs. And then this December, we had a very significant act, um, report released, report to the legislature, and so often these reports are a dime a dozen, but this one was a big one, which said that it was a result of an expert panel in multiple years working on looking at direct potable reuse, and could we safely develop regulations? The answer was yes. The answer came back loud and clear, we can safely develop regulations for direct potable reuse. Um, what did, and, and how we, um, and so what we are now looking at now is um, the Water Board also identified a number of research areas that we need to work on in the next few years while they are hopefully concurrently developing the regulations. So what quickly what the DPR means is either it's, what right now it's in statute is um, that purified water going directly into a drinking water distribution system or quote upstream of a dis uh, distribution system. So this has been a little bit unclear. So we're actually running uh, Water Reuse California and California Coast Keepers Alliance have teamed up this year to sponsor some legislation to get more specific on exactly how to characterize direct potable reuse so that the regulators can develop the regulations and also to give the State Water Board a deadline of 2021, uh, maybe changing soon to 2022, <laughs> in, um, in statute. And we're hoping that will give them enough time to work with the, reg with the research they need. Obviously, if the research isn't done, they're not moving forward. So we do think they need that deadline. So that's where it is. As I said, it's a very exciting time for DPR because I think we're, we're, making, we're making some progress. Excellent, thank you. Assembly member, there's a perception by some agencies, not me, this is not my question. <laughs> there's <laughs> There's a perception by some agencies your efforts will reduce or take away needed local control by giving the state greatly increased control in water management during a drought. How do you plan to bring agencies with that perception on board? All right, who asked that question? No, I'm kidding. Uh, hands are there. Okay, so first let me explain where the language from 1668 came from. The language came directly from the governor's trailer bill. Um, about um, water conservation as a way of life. And the reason that we took that language and put it into our own bill was because we wanted to have this discussion with stakeholders. Rather than having the governor write a piece of legislation, get it through the budget as he would have, and we had our budget vote actually just yesterday and every single trailer bill that the governor put into that budget sailed through without any problem. So we pulled it out of there so that we could have the discussion with all of the stakeholders and modify the policy the way that we think the policy should be, should be modified, which is through a series of hearings and through talking to stakeholders and sitting down with people, which is what we've been doing for the past several months. The reason that the bill, the, the legislation itself, really does not impact local control in the way that I think some agencies do is because while the state sets the standards in terms of your target, for water use. It allows every single agency across the state to look at their own needs, whether they're serving agriculture, commercial, residential, their hydrology, their conditions, their sources of water, and do planning for themselves based on that. So even though they get to, at the end of the day, approve those plans, it's up to each agency to develop the plan on their own. So I think that it does retain that local control. And the goal, again, is to get you to a high level of efficiency so that we don't get into a position again where you're being given arbitrary percentage reductions that may or may not set, make sense for your users and for your agency. Thank you. This question is for both of you and assembly member, I'd like to start with you. Prop one, you heard it, the water bond is virtually tapped out. Are you aware of any resources, funding that will be made available to help support some of the long-term planning efforts? Hearing anything about another water bond? Do you feel it's too soon to go back to to um, voters for more money? I think it's probably too soon, uh, you know, just being honest. I, I haven't heard anybody talking about doing another water bond right now. I haven't heard about any new sources. That doesn't mean they're not out there. Uh, certainly there's a lot of stuff that's talked about in Sacramento that I never hear about. Uh, I have not personally heard about um, uh, a water bond sources. I, I can tell you they're talking about putting a very um, large park bond on the ballot 
next year. I can't imagine they would do a park bond and a water bond at the same time. And of course, we just had the um, passage of SB1, which was the gas tax. And, uh, and that was very, con you know, a difficult vote in the past. And we also are now looking at a cap and trade extension. So there's all, I think there's a, probably a sensitivity to how much money uh, people in California are going to be expected to pay for all manner of infrastructure and uh, different uses. Jennifer, any part of that that you significantly agree with, disagree? Well, um, you know, in terms of Prop 1, you're right that the recycled water portion, the $625 million that we got in Proposition 1 is largely committed. But there are, I, th I believe there's still funding in, in the Integrated Regional Water Management Program funds that does fund recycling, so there's opportunities there. But, you know, in general, I would say that looking at, um, you know, a bond in the future, I've certainly heard rumors and discussions of some kind of a park bond that might be going outside of the legislative process to go to be put straight on the ballot with rumors of some small amount of funding for recycled water or stormwater capture or some other discussion. I, you know, is it too soon? Um, you know, that's, that's a, someone with a higher pay grade, but um, I, I, I'm for it. <laughs> I hope not. I hope, I hope we can still, because we, we definitely need more funding. One of the problems we're having is the clean water state revolving fund in the state is also under huge stress. And this is a huge pot of funding that we have used traditionally to fund recycled water and potable reuse projects. So we are in a world of hurt on the funding side very quickly. And this wasn't the case two years ago. So. You had any kind of a champion emerge in the legislature for direct potable reuse? Well, we certainly have um, uh, Assembly Member Quirk, who is carrying our bill, AB 574, has really championed the bill. He's a scientist and um, I think an astrophysicist. So he really likes the technology involved. He believes in it. He is a uh, rocket scientist. He, he is a rocket scientist. <laughs> so great to work with an actual rocket scientist. So this bill went all the way through the assembly and now we've hit the Senate, which is harder going. So that'll, looking forward to those challenges. <laughs> Can I just add, one of the things that the working group has had uh, quite a robust discussion about and that's continuing is ways of incentivizing the, uh, incentivizing the investments into reclaimed water, recycled water, potable reuse. So there's a lot of talk about how that will work if we do have targets, if we do have sort of water budgeting, what you get from that, you know, is that water going to be uh, immune from any kind of drought uh, uh, contingency reductions? Uh, and would that be the incentive? Or would you have a certain uh, percentage sort of that you would get of that water as sort of a water credit? And so those discussions are ongoing, but hopefully that's, you know, a way that even without funding being dedicated, that water agencies will see the value in making those investments um, themselves as they, as they can. Jennifer, this is that question about why do you think it's taking so long? And the easy answer is we live in the state of California. I get that part. <laughs> but do you think there's agencies waiting for DPR regs to be um, put in place before they pull the trigger? Are there any other significant factors? Uh, absolutely. I, I do believe it. You know, as we look at the, uh, the, the groundwater regulations, we didn't have regulations for years. They permitted them on a case-by-case -case basis. Agencies didn't know what was required. Um, after the adoption of the reg statewide regulations, we have 15 or 16 projects now looking at groundwater replenishment. I believe the same is the case with surface water, and I believe it will be the same with DPR. Agencies need that assurances in regulations to know. So um, I would expect that after we get closer, we're, we're not there yet. As I said, we even have a research component. But in terms of why is it taking so long, I, like I said, we've made 2010, the concept of DPR was put into the statute. I mean, I know that seems, that's seven years ago, but that's not that really long. So um, we're, 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 we're moving it as fast as we can. And how many potential projects did you say might be out there? Um, you know, I don't have a count at this point. I've heard water agencies say there that maybe five or six projects being considered for a DPR at this point that have told me. Not that they'd always tell me. <laughs> so. So, can I ask you some questions now? What if I said no? No. <laughs> no, you got to answer. So, since we're on the topic, what are some of the challenges of a large IPR project, um, getting a large IPR project off the ground in Los Angeles? <laughs> and, and many of you are familiar with this one. Probably the number one challenge is public perception for us. 
2000, LA built and operated an indirect potable reuse project called the East Valley Project in the San Fernando Basin. It was going to do about 10,000 acre feet of recycled water, put it back in that groundwater basin. It had all its permitting uh, requirements. It was protective of public health, but it immediately picked up the label of toilet to tap. Um, and the lack of public assistance shut the project down in one day. So it's a great example of how perception of the facts becomes the reality and how that challenge has to be proactively managed. The um, LA's invested tremendous effort in trying to inform the public. They have a variety of recycled water advisory groups. They engage in all kinds of discussions. The um, public acceptance and political support is going to be key. And Orange County, I think, is the epitome of the push to gain that level of acceptance. And I'm happy that LA looks not just internal to itself, but also at the successes of people in other counties. Another one is the availability of wastewater. We've heard that a couple times today. I'm not going to go over it too heavily, but we have um, one of the unintended consequences is obviously less sewer flow. And less sewer flow leads to less potential for recycled water. Another one in LA is like similar to the Delta and others. There are concomitant goals that sometimes are in conflict with one another. One in LA is to balance the needs of the LA River, where a lot of recycled water goes now. LA River restoration is a key initiative for the city of LA. We work with a variety of stakeholders to ensure that we balance that against the water needs. Science and technology, I don't know about you folks, but I turn around and there's a new iteration. Yeah. My husband's complaining his iPad is less than a year old and he needs a new one. Really? <laughs> he does. He does. <laughs> That's what he told me, too. <laughs> exactly. So we continue in LA to test a variety of pilot technologies, trying to get ahead and see what's going to hit. Regulations, uh, like Jennifer mentioned, people are always looking for regulatory certainty. There were draft projects being built under Title 22 that was in draft form, revised frequently, so it makes it more difficult. And it was 2016 that the regulations were finalized. So hopefully that additional level of security, even though there'll be additional gaps and additional challenges, is going to help. So it's DPR then is a possibility for Los Angeles? Yes. <laughs> yes. The In short addition answer. to groundwater replenishment, yeah. the, um, which by the way, Mayor Garcetti calls showers to flowers. I like his... <laughs> City's been a supporter of regional recycling, um, sponsored by Metropolitan, and the project foresees the possibility of advanced treating recycled water and delivering water to the regional groundwater basins. So other than the regs, what do they need to accomplish this in Los Angeles? First and foremost, political and uh, public support. You, you just have to keep talking about it, the benefits of it, why the analysis that's been done, the safety surrounding it. Um, ensuring that Angelinos at some point can accept a form of DPR pending regulatory approval will obviously depend on their comfort and their understanding. And again, this is an area that I think Orange County has led the way. Uh, you're going to need substantial regional collaboration. You heard today the places we can locate these facilities, property, piping requirements, access to aquifers, these are all limited. So finding the real estate um, or constructing pipeline to distant drinking water sites, that's, that's a significant challenge and we work with our regional partners to try and address that. Uh, having to rethink wastewater treatment. We built it all to clean it up for environmental discharge. It would have been great at the time to have allowed potentially for the development of potable reuse then because now all this infrastructure is either going to need to be retrofit or rebuilt new. So that's a significant one. Real-time monitoring technologies. You know the difference between in, indirect and direct potable reuse is that buffer time. And right now we use the environmental buffer, but you've got to test recycled water after it's treated. That means you've got to sample test, understand the result, and respond if that's what you need to do. A buffer buys you time, but for DPR, we're going to need substantial real-time monitoring technologies that will have to be implied, uh, implemented in place of an environmental buffer. You talked a little about, uh, keep talking about it, communication. Well, trust of a utility is a key factor in getting communities to support reuse projects, obviously. Um, but even with your billing challenges that LADWP faced, voters overwhelmingly supported the rate increases for water industry 
infrastructure. So why was this the case, and how did LA make that happen? For those of you who are not aware, um, LA was granted a five-year rate increase for both water and power. Um, it basically happened because we went overwhelmingly public. We held over 85 meetings, many of which I was at, senior staff was at, uh, to community groups. We were in the media. We launched a rate website. We did videos, slideshows, handouts, display boards. And if this sounds familiar to the OC groundwater replenishment outreach, you'd be correct. Um, sometimes our community meetings had standing room only. Sometimes there was one enthusiastic customer and eight of us sitting in the room. <laughs> <laughs> but we based it on concepts that people understood. By and large, the rate increases were sold on the criticality of infrastructure. The timing, the deterioration, LA went through a big building boom in the 1920s and there was a big um, slug of infrastructure that went in at that time that's growing now to be 100 years old. Legislative and legal mandates, everybody throws that in. Uh, we focused on educating the community how much of our water is imported and the criticality of hardening local supplies. And then the customer service um, billing issues, we also spoke to them about how that rehab allows us to supply them new programs, incentives, and options to improve their current situation. Um, and then lastly, we work hard. I still say we. I am the former, but I have not yet changed my, pro my pronouns around. So bear with me, I still say we. Um, it's critical to keep rates competitive. And it's critical to be able to explain that to a constituency why you believe that rates are an important um, approach. So by doing so, we got political leaders, neighborhood council representatives, business community leaders, and other opinion leaders in a variety of groups that supported the rate increase and helped bring it through. All right, one more question. If you could rewind the clock 10 years before the drought to say 2007, what are the three, thing, three things you, uh, you think LADWP or the water industry could or should have done differently in terms of projects, policy decisions, or communications about water delivery and use? I love a good rhetorical question. <laughs> um, push harder on potable reuse legislation earlier. Yeah. Um, accelerate the development of recycled water at Hyperion. The accelerate the development, of, I mean, you hear, the, you hear the themes. You heard that when the sun shines is when you should be doing this work, not when you're at the end of a five-year drought. Yeah. Um, again, development of uh, accelerate regional recycling. Study the water needs and try to find the appropriate balance point between the needs of the LA River and the other use of recycled water. Yeah. You only wanted three, but I have two more. One of them's <laughs> actually, I think, kind of, invest in real-time monitoring. We talked about that issue of you have to be able to test, treat, understand before water's released. That's going to depend on a lot of this smart technology. And everyone agrees it's moving at the speed of light, but we have to be comfortable that it is there before we push even harder. And I think, I thought I thought of one more. Nope, that was it. The, uh, I'm going to take the license of the princess in the pink chair for just a moment. Um, you'll notice everybody on stage is uh, a woman. There is a disproportionate number of women in the field of water management and state and federal offices. Women fill close to half of all the jobs in the U.S. economy, but they still hold less than 25% of STEM jobs. It's been the case throughout the past decade, even though college-educated college women have continued to push forward. In terms of elected office, women are 21% of California state legislature. Nationwide, it's 19%. I would ask if the two of you could quickly share with us challenges you might have faced in your career and offer up any advice that you might have for those are, um, who are still in the process. So how much time do we have? <laughs> yeah. No, I want to. Uh, it's like eight minutes. Yeah. It's a great question, and this is a, a subject, given that the women in the legislature have been uh, shrinking and disappearing over the past several years. This is the topic of entire panels right now across the state of California and trying to find ways to encourage women to run and then to support them and help them win. Because running is part of it, but you also have to win. Otherwise, you, you know, it doesn't help very much. So here's a few things I can tell you. When I ran uh, for assembly, I had a field of you know, people. I was the only, there was two women actually, and there were a bunch of men. 
One of the men was um, 25 or 26 years old, just graduated college. Another one was in his 30s. He had never, as far as I know, never really held a job outside of being elected and holding different various elected positions. Um, women, the statistics show, have to be asked to run multiple times before they'll really consider running. I can tell you from personal experience that I agonized. Am I ready? Can I do it? Can I raise the money? That's a tough one for women. Can I call people and ask for money? Men, men, what is it with you men? You, gra you, you roll over in bed one day and you say, I'm going to run for Congress. And you, you go and you do it. You know, it's very different for women because they aren't often raised with those expectations and with, those, with that belief that they're supposed to be there. Well, why is, it, why is that? Because they don't see other women in those roles. They don't see their communities being managed by women. They don't see the heads of the departments often of their cities being women. So they don't have that expectation and they have to be asked. So number one, the thing we can do is to ask women to run and then support them when they run. Help them find resources, help do a fundraiser for them, get people to support them. Uh, it's really, really important. Um, and they do need to be asked over and over again. And I'll ask every single woman who's sitting in this room today to think about it. Why don't you run for office? Why don't you run for city council, town council, commissioner, water board, some of you I know have, mayor, and there's one sitting over there right now. Thank you for running. Um, why don't you run for assembly? Why don't you run for Congress? Um, they have to be asked multiple times. The men, you don't have to ask them. They're just going to run. Um, and then I'll give you uh, another uh, insight, which is about assumptions. So when I first got elected to the Glendale Council, I remember this group of male leaders coming in to see me, male community leaders, and I sat down, and just to, to give you a little context, so I was the first woman on the Glendale City Council in 10 years. The city of Glendale was, a, was incorporated in 1906. It's a five-person council, an election every two years. How many women do you think there had been from 1906 to when I was elected in 2009? Someone shout it out. See, people, you know what? When I set it up like that, people just get really cynical. No, it wasn't three, it wasn't zero, it was six. Six in a hundred years, <laughs> right? So I got elected, I'm sitting there, this male leaders come in, they say, well, we're so happy you're here. Great, we are so happy you're here because now you have brought heart onto the council. <laughs> brought the heart. <laughs> Sorry, that's So you're funny. laughing. I have men sometimes say, well, what's wrong with that? I sat there and what I'm hearing is, you're not the brains, you're not the planner, you don't have experience, you're somehow, you're the emotional part. That's you're gonna be your role, you know? You're the one that I guess sits up and cries sometimes. It, it didn't know me very well. Um, so we have to reconsider our own expectations of what a woman leader is, what her role is, and what she does. I'm doing some awfully wonky legislation up in Sacramento. Um, and uh, women can do that. We can be really wonky. We've got a wonky panel right here. Uh, but the, you know, a lot of times we're not seen as being the planners. We're not seen as being the engineers, the rock and scientists, the politicians, the leaders. And we all have to work really hard to overcome that and to give our girls and our teenagers the notion that, you know, hello Disney, we're not just princesses. We don't, we're not around to be rescued. We can do the rescuing as well. So I think we have to change all of that before we're ever going to have the representation, uh, the percentage representation that really reflects the makeup of our nation and as our, of our state, which is we're over 50% of the population. Why are we only 20% of the representation? Woo! Get up and do the wave. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to go after that. I was going to say, no, you want to follow that? I don't want to follow that. I'm right that. there with you. <laughs> We want to ensure there's time to take some questions from the audience. We got about two, three minutes left. Can I just say one more thing about that? Certainly. <laughs> we just, please. We just passed a really interesting bill in, in, in the assembly. It hasn't gone through the Senate yet, but it actually feeds into this, which is why are women paid less than men? Why? And we know that they are. We just passed a bill that says you are no longer allowed to ask your new hire or an applicant for a position what they made in their previous job. Hmm. Why is that? Why? Because the women are paid less. So if you ask them what they got paid and you base your new salary, their new salary upon that, they're always gonna be paid less. Because the men walk in having been paid more and it perpetuates an inequality in wages. Sure. So sometimes things where you wonder, well, why did they do that? There's really a reason behind it. And one of the imperatives in the state of California is to lift women out of poverty. 
Because as much as California has led the country in the economic recovery from the recession, you know who's been left behind? Women and children. And you know who the fastest growing population on the streets of Los Angeles is? Senior women who took care of their spouses, usually to the end of their life because the women live longer, go to any nursing home, it's filled with women. The men in the nursing home, by the way, are the most popular people on earth. When my great uncle moved into the, into the leisure world, on a daily basis, that man gets deliveries of cookies and muffins and everything else. So men, you've got you to set, you know, if you make it to those years. Um, but the, the women end up without the means to take care of themselves. A lot of times they lose their homes paying for that spouse when he goes into a nursing home or new assisted living. We've got to do better and make sure that we have economic independence uh, for women because they are ending up in the streets of Los Angeles. And that's something we should all be thinking about. Sorry. <laughs> Bravo. Bravo. I thought that was an excellent use of time. Woo. All right, questions? <laughs> we have time for a couple. You know, I don't, I don't know the numbers for MET. I bet Jeff or some of the other board members would, but I do know in the city of Los Angeles, um, since Eric Garcetti was elected, he brought the number of women on boards and commissions to a full 50%. Jerry Brown has been very good at appointing women uh, to boards and commissions as well. In fact, his chief of staff are, is a woman and you know, one of the most powerful people in Sacramento. Um, but you know, where's our woman governor? Uh, where's our, you know, we haven't, I don't think we've ever had one, right? I don't know, I can tell you that MET 30 years ago doesn't look like MET today oh, yeah. in terms of that board, women and minority representation, and, and that's a great thing. Anybody else? Let's not all rush over us to get to the valet now. <laughs> Ladies, that was awesome. Wait, Give them a big round. Oh, hold hey, it, hold it. We, I'm it. sorry. Got a thing. Thanks for showing up, sir. It's... Hi, my name's uh, Dr. Alan Bernstein. I'm the mayor of the city of Tustin. First of all, I want to congratulate everyone for a wonderful day. The summit was awesome. Let's give it up for the summit. I just want to say one thing. Uh, when I look around the room here, I see a tremendous amount of women in mm -hmm. this room. And I will bet that not one of them is in a position of authority with whatever organization they're with because they're a woman. They're in a position of authority because they've garnered respect, put the time and work in, and have distinguished themselves. And so I'm not quite sure that anyone here would vote for anybody simply because they're a woman. They should be voted for because they deserve the position because of their education, training, experience, and the accomplishments that they've had. And I congratulate all of you for doing so. But again, I just felt that I wanted to share with you that no one should deserve any position because of their race, color, creed, religion, any of that. They should simply be honored for the work ethic that they have and the contribution they, that they can make to the people they represent. And thank you for coming. Thanks. Well, all right. If you'd like to continue this, we're going to march down Catella Avenue in 45 minutes. <laughs> because water knows no gender, ladies and gentlemen. Right. I'm sorry, did somebody want to say something? I heard somebody. Yep. Uh. I was going to respond, but oh. maybe yeah. I shouldn't. No, I think you should. <laughs> oh, no, I'm dying to hear it. I think you should. I was thinking about it too, but I'd I think you do. should. You lit this fire. Let's go. <laughs> Come on, isn't this more fun go than talking it. about water, right? Uh, you know, it, it's, it's true that, you know, we certainly want everybody to end up where they are because, strictly because of their ability, but let's face it, different people get different opportunities in life and different, w different times, of, uh, different uh, opportunities in terms of their education, expectations that are put on them. And there are people that have to wor work a lot harder um, to get past those initial barriers that are put in place. Women are starting to overcome that, and that's terrific. I don't see a ton of, you know, I don't see the racial and ethnic makeup in this room that represents the state of California. We certainly have more work to do on that. I think that the work that we need to do is to get it to where everybody really does have that equal opportunity. And then everyone that is as bright and as determined always has the ability to rise and take their 
rightful place that they deserve in terms of occupation, uh, elected representation, and economic status. We're not there yet. We have a ways to go, which means that we need to reach down and help those people up at the same time. Help up those women, help up people that for all kinds of reasons are, are sometimes not given those opportunities. So we have to have first a level playing field before we can then blame people for not achieving what they want to achieve. So that would be my Nicely response. said. Please give our guests a round of applause. The Honorable Laura Friedman. Thank you. Thanks Marcy for Edwards, very entertaining. And good to see you again, Marcy. Jennifer West, thank you so much, ladies. That was awesome. <laughs> And thank you again to all of our sponsors, folks. We hope you enjoyed the program. I would personally like to say this was spectacular. And I was mentioning to somebody that I wish I could have brought a couple of the uh, reporters who were assigned to the drought issue and the water issue during the peak of the crisis to come and hear this, because this was this would have been a research project. It was so informative, every aspect of it. It was a pleasure for me to be a part of it. It was uh, uh, the dissemination of greater knowledge and appreciation for water and water management, and you're all very inspiring. Thank you for including me. Have a great day, and be safe going home.